everyone. I'm starting a new series on calculus for deep learning. The viewers of these videos will be someone who has zero or basic understanding of the principles of calculus. We'll start by understanding a brief overview of neural networks and then see how calculus fits into this equation. So let's get started. We see here the activation of a single computation unit in a neural network. Here x1, x2 until xn are the input vectors and w1, w2 until wn are the weight vectors. We have a summation operator here. The function of a summation operator is to sum the dot products of the input and weight vectors. The output of the summation operator is added to a scalar bias p. The complete operation can be represented in the form of an equation as zx equals summation operator starting i equals 1 loop until n is obtained wi xi plus p. Here function zx is called unit affine function. The output of zx is then made to pass to an activation function. Let us now see how we can calculate the activation of a neuron. The term activation of a neuron basically means that the neuron is triggering an output value of either 0 or some positive number. For calculating this value, we have already seen that zx equals summation operator n i equals 1, wi xi plus b, which equals w dot x plus b. Let's suppose we had n equals 3. So this equation becomes w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 plus b. Function zx here is called the units affine function and is followed by a rectified linear unit which clips the negative values to zero. So if you go back to the previous slide, we've seen that this zx is actually made to pass to an activation function. The activation function we're using here is actually a rectified linear unit. This rectified linear unit function takes in two arguments, zero and zx, and then returns back the maximum of the two value. So if zx was a negative number, the output would have been zero, if zx was a positive number, then the output would have been the positive number itself. So we saw only a single neuron in the previous slide. However, neural networks consist of many of these units stacked together. This stacking is actually called layers. The activation of the act the activation of layer units becomes the activation of one layer units become the input to the next layer's unit and the activation unit in the final layer is called the network output. Training this neuron means you're choosing weights w and bias b so that the desired output for all n inputs is obtained. To do this, we minimize the loss function that compares the network's final activation or the predicted x with the target x for all input vectors. To minimize the loss, we use some variations on gradient descent, such as plain stochastic gradient descent, SGD, or SGD with momentum, or Adams. If at this point in time you're not sure what gradient descent is, and you're not sure what exactly target and predicted variables are, that is fine because I will be discussing loss function equations and gradient descents and target and predicted variables in detail later. We can keep, though what we can keep in mind here is that finding the gradient of an activation x with respect to the model parameters w and b requires partial derivatives. Our goal is to gradually tweak w and b so that the overall loss function keeps getting smaller across all x inputs. And that's where differential calculus comes into play. So let us now quickly look at some important formula for scalar derivative rules. The derivative of a constant is a zero. If you're multiplying a function with a constant and we need to find its derivative, what you do is you take the constant out and you find the derivative with respect to the function. So this becomes df by dx. If you have to find the derivative with respect to some power rule, and what you do is you take the power out and 
put it, put that as the coefficient. So basically n becomes the coefficient to x and then you subtract 1 from the power value. Some rule f plus g, you need to differentiate both, both the functions independently and the plus sign is retained. So this becomes tf by dx plus dg by dx. Similarly, with the difference rule, we're going to differentiate the functions independently and place the negative sign in middle. Product rule is an interesting case because we are adding a plus sign here because it's not originally there in the expression. So in case of product rule, what we do is we take first, first function as a constant and then differentiate with respect to the second function. Then we add a plus sign and then we differentiate the function with respect to the first function, taking the second function as a constant. So in this case, we've taken f as a constant and we're differentiating the function g with respect to x. Then we've added a plus sign here. And then now we're taking g as a constant and differentiating function f with respect to x. Chain rule is again an interesting case here. So what we do is we replace the function with a new variable. So gx, let's suppose we replace gx with u. You can choose any, yeah, any variable name, u, v, x, y, z, whatever works for you. And so then this expression becomes f of u. And now we'll differentiate f of u with respect to du. And then multiply this expression with du differentiated with dx separately. So this and this gets cancelled and we get the original expression back. Okay. So let us take some examples and it should be more clear. So now differentiating 20, it's a constant. So it will be 0. Let us, uh, let us take this one now. So we have 3 as a coefficient and x as the variable. So when this is the case, what we do is we take the constant out and we differentiate ddx with respect to x. So this is just 1. So 3 times 1 is 3. So the output is 3 here. Now we're differentiating x with respect raised to the power of 4. So 4 becomes the coefficient in front of the variable. So this becomes 4. And x, n minus 1, n is 4 here. So 4 minus 1 is 3. So this becomes 4x cubed. Next is with addition. So again, we can apply the power rule independently to these expressions. So ddx with respect to x cubed plus ddx with respect to 3x squared. We are taking this independently. So this becomes 3x squared and this becomes plus 6x. Again, uh, subtraction is very similar to addition. What we've done, we, we're just going to replace the sign with the negative value. That's all. Now, interesting case is a multiplication value. So I want us to pay a little more attention here. First, what we'll do is we'll take x squared as constant and take out the value and multiply this with a differentiating value of just x. Then we'll add a plus sign here and we'll take x out this time, treating this as a constant value and differentiating this with respect to x squared. So this becomes differentiating x with respect to just dx becomes 1. So this becomes x squared plus this is x squared. So the 2 adds up here as per the power rule. So this becomes 2x squared. This becomes 3x squared right here. Now the last one is the chain rule one. And I want us to pay a little more attention here because chain rule will is one of the most important rules we will be using. Uh, even in the later sessions. So let's just go ahead and replace x squared with u. So this becomes log of u. And now we will di differentiate this with respect to du. So just keep in mind if you, you have to differentiate a log function, this becomes 1 by the value with what you're differentiating. So this becomes 1 by u. And now u was x squared. So we'll independently differentiate x squared. So d dx with respect to x squared will be the next expression. So this basically becomes 2x divided by u. u was x squared. So we put this here, 1x and 1x gets cancelled and we get 2 by x here. So these were some of the examples. So now, so let us now move from the world of scalar derivatives to vector derivatives. But before we understand vector derivatives, we need to understand partial derivatives. Neural networks are functions of multiple parameters such as f of x comma y. That is why we compute the derivatives with respect to 
one variable at a time. This gives us multiple derivatives for multiple parameters taken one at a time. This is called as partial derivatives. Partial derivatives is represented by del upon del x pronounced as del. For functions of single parameters, del by del x equals d by dx. So we have two arguments here, x comma y. So we'll have to differentiate this function with respect to both the variables, with respect once with respect to x and once with respect to y. And since we are differentiating them with respect to different variables, this is called as partial derivatives. Okay. So now we have a function here, f of x comma y equals x y. We have two parameters, x and y, right? So first we'll differentiate this function with respect to x and then we'll differentiate it with respect to y. So the representation becomes del f x comma y with respect to del x. And then the second one becomes del f function x comma y with respect to del y. Okay, so matrix calculus. Now when we move from derivatives of one function to derivatives of many functions, we move from vector calculus to matrix calculus. <clears throat> so let us suppose we have two functions, f x comma y and g x comma y given by. So here are the functions. I want us to keep two things in mind. Here we have two functions and we have two variables, okay? We can have more than two functions and we can definitely have more than two variables as well, okay? So now f of x comma y is given as 4x cubed by y. So let us first differentiate this expression with respect to y. So del of 4x cubed times y, differentiating with respect to del y becomes 4x cubed. Why? Because 4x cubed becomes a constant and we are differentiating del y with respect to del y, which is one. Now let us differentiate the same expression with respect to x. This becomes y becomes a constant because we're differentiating this expression with respect to x. Um, the power rule can be applied here. So no much rocket science. This becomes 12 x square y. So the partial derivative, this the, the reverse triangle sign is also used to represent partial derivative. Function x comma y becomes 12 x square y with comma 4 x cubed. Now let us take the second function as an example, g x comma y is 4x cubed plus y. Here we can apply the addition rule. So independently, we will be differentiating these two expressions, first with respect to x and then with respect to y. So let's just go ahead and do it first with respect to x. This becomes 12x squared. And since we are differentiating with respect to x, y is a constant, so it becomes 0. So we have a 12x squared here. Let us now differentiate this expression with respect to del y. This becomes 1 because this is a constant. So this is 12x squared comma 1. Now we can represent this in the form of a matrix, something like this. J equals del of f x comma y, del of g x comma y equals, now del f x comma y by del x, del f x comma y by del y, del g x comma y by del x, and del g x comma y by del y. So we can plug in those values here. This is also called as Jacobian matrix or just Jacobi, okay? So pretty simple representation. I don't think it needs much discussion, right? So we've just independently placed the values of the partial derivatives of the function. This was my function f and this was my function g, right? So <clears throat> let us quickly understand numerator layout and denominator layout. So originally, my Jacobian function representation was function f x comma y and function g x comma y, correct? So we wrote them in this form, del f x comma y by del x and del f x comma y by del y and similarly del g x comma y by del x and del g x comma y by del y. So we plug in those values, this becomes 12 x square y, 4 x cube, whatever the value we found in the previous slides, right? 12 x square one. This representation is called the numerator layout. Keep in mind in numerator layout, the function on your first row is the function in itself. So what I'm trying to say is this is a function f x comma y and this is also function f x comma y. We're just di differentiating them with respect to different variables. But the function is still the same on the same row. 
However, if you transpose this, it becomes a denominator layout. And in this case, the representation, when you transpose this, it becomes 12x squared y, 12x squared, 4x cube, and 1 here. So basically, you're shifting this here, and this becomes this comes here. So in denominator layout, you have two functions, and their differentiating value with respect to x are on the same row, okay? So this function's differentiating value with respect to x comes here, and this value which we were differentiating with respect to y comes here. So these two representations you might want to keep in mind because they are a little, they'll, they'll be a little important down the line in the next few sessions, okay? So this is pretty much it for this session. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them on the comments section or write to me on, write to me through the website. Yeah, thank you so much.